And good afternoon. I'm Jerry Buckley, um, and I'm the director of corporate and foundation relations uh, here in the Office of Advancement. And um, I am going to be your moderator today. And I am delighted to welcome you. Um, it is a uh, fabulous sunny day here in Geneva, and we are uh, ready for a fantastic, uh, perhaps unusually warm uh, weekend uh, in Geneva. Uh, but we are really looking forward to um, our second graduation in a matter of weeks. And uh, the class of 2020 uh, is here. Uh, we'll be here over the weekend and their families. And um, we're delighted to have all of you who are joining us uh, today by Zoom. As Teresa was saying, we obviously, we wish we were all in person, uh, but we are uh, making the best of it as we have all year at the colleges. And uh, so we're looking forward to uh, certainly looking forward to, uh, to next year. Um, clearly um, our topic today, uh, climate change and the impact uh, of climate change on the Finger Lakes, uh, as well as uh, the wine industry, uh, which is uh, so important to the tourism industry is a uh, very, very timely topic. And we are really fortunate to have two people who can speak to speak to those issues uh, and engage us in a, in a conversation. Um, we have Dr. Lisa Kleckner, who is the director of the Finger Lakes Institute, um, has been the director since uh, 2011. Uh, Lisa is, uh, is a dynamo who has uh, really uh, helped uh, to bring uh, the FLI to, a, to another level. Uh, she has her PhD from the University of Michigan uh, and she has been instrumental in attracting funding from uh, the federal government, state government, local government, uh, as well as private foundations and individuals. So um, we're delighted to have Lisa here. Um, John Halfman, uh, some of you know uh, from the classroom uh, and from, uh, from the, uh, the Scanling Research Vessel. Uh, you may also even know him from any number of sports activities on campus where John is a, uh, is a constant uh, and a wonderful supporter of Hobart and William Smith Athletics. Uh, John has been uh, a professor of geoscience uh, and environmental studies, has been with Hobart and William Smith since 1994. Um, he is, um, as I say, um, ubiquitous in many ways. And when it comes to zebra mussels and harmful algal blooms and all kinds of things like that, uh, John is, um, is our resident expert. And I have the personal pleasure uh, in the last four and a half years to work closely with John and Lisa. Um, and I can tell you, um, it is, uh, it's been a real, a real pleasure uh, to see the work that, uh, that they do. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lisa and then John in, uh, in just a moment, but we thought um, we would give you a little sense, uh, especially for those of you who maybe haven't been back to Geneva recently, uh, we wanted to uh, give you a little sense of, uh, of the Finger Lakes and get you in the Finger Lakes mood. Uh, so we have a short video uh, that we're going to tee up and then we're going to go to John and Lisa and we will have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers uh, as we move through our session. So take a look uh, at our video.
Well, um, we hope you enjoyed that. Um, I want to uh, give a, a thank you, um, a personal one, to my daughter, Madeline, uh, who is William Smith class of 2015, um, who um, video together and had assistance uh, from Lauren Tablot, who is a uh, William Smith student who's been working with Lisa Kleckner in the Finger Lakes Institute. So um, I'll turn it over to Lisa and we'll get the rest of the program uh, started. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jerry and Teresa. And it's um, our pleasure to welcome you all here today and to talk a little bit more about the Finger Lakes region and the amazing water and land that we have and some of the things that will be or are being impacted by climate change and are projected to be in the future. So as every you know, professor says, every presenter, we have a few slides to share with you um, with, about some of the research and some of the programs we have going on. So I'm gonna share my screen now and just make sure, maybe Teresa, you can tell me that things look okay for the slides. Yep, there you Are go. That good? Yeah. Terrific, okay. So amazing beautiful campus. I know you all know this, but I love showing this title slide every time we have a chance to present around the region. And before we get started in some of the, um, you know, the meat of the program, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the Finger Lakes Institute and, you know, what our role is on campus and, you know, the role that we play in the region. Uh, the FLI, as we'll call it, or I'll call it through the day, is was established in 2004. And we provide research and education about the Finger Lakes environment. And if you haven't been to our building, we're right on South Main Street overlooking Seneca Lake. And it's a beautiful location and it's a perfect place where we can play a translational role between a lot of the science that happens on campus and you know, how that factors into decision-making um, across the region. We have four programs at the Finger Lakes Institute, research, education, outreach, and watershed stewardship. Um, I think as an undergraduate institution, Hobart and William Smith Colleges, having a research vessel is an incredibly unique asset. And so, you know, since we're perched on camp, you know, right on the lake, I mean, it's such a wonderful opportunity for our students to be able to go out and do hands-on experiments in the classroom, but also follow through on research projects throughout the year. Um, education um, program, you know, that's referenced here, it really focuses on K through 12. Uh, we have an EPA award winning science on Seneca program. It's been around since 1986. And so we have, uh, you know, K through 12 students coming to campus along with their teachers to do hands-on um, experiments, again, experiential learning with watershed issues. We also do a lot with outreach. So we do a lot of work with the public, um, you know, and looking at really taking information about the environment and spurring people to action and being involved in you know, issues like invasive species or nutrient mitigation, um, land use and things like that. And then watershed stewardship really kind of pulls all of this together because what happens on the land in you know, lakes really, or you know, in a watershed basically affects what happens in the lake itself. And you know, our two main, um, economic drivers in the region, as you saw from the video, it's really tourism and it's agriculture. So between the two of those, $4 billion a year of economic um, activity, uh, the, the lakes support things like the Bassmasters. So, and don't, let's not forget that Seneca Lake is also the, tra the, the lake trout capital of the world and has had a fishing tournament since 1965. And it's really, the Finger Lakes now is a global brand um, the wine and the food have brought that to us, but people come here and they're just amazed at the beauty of the lake and the landscape. And we're just really, really uh, fortunate to have such a beautiful setting. So a few facts about the Finger Lakes. Um, they're pictured here on the left, there's 11 of them. The inlets for the lakes are usually, are, are in the south part of the lake and the lakes, you know, the, there are, the outlets are in the north. And so the lakes eventually empty into the Great Lakes. And so things that happen to the Great Lakes, we can study in the Finger Lakes, albeit on a smaller scale, but our research has really great connections to, um, to Great Lakes programs. 
And so now I'm gonna to pivot to climate change and just give a very high level overview of some of the issues that can impact lakes. And, you know, a lot of this lovely figure, you know, I think as, as scientists, we're just now reconciling a lot of the data that we can get our hands on and start to understand how the climate change that we're seeing over the last couple of decades is starting to impact our systems. And lakes is one of the systems that are, are being impacted. And you know this. If, if I'm sure there's scientists in this um, in this crowd, this is a wonderful paper and has this conceptual diagram about you know how energy is exchanged between the atmosphere and water, and how temperature changes can manifest themselves um, you know from the air and into the water and then back again. And so the thing that I'm just going to present very briefly on are extreme precipitation events but know that mixing in the lake, so that's the stratification of warm water from cold water, and then also the extent of ice cover and how long it lasts are also major issues. And then John's gonna spend some time talking about lake surface water temperatures and the impact that that's having on the health of our ecosystems. So I just wanna point out, um, this is a, a GIS map that one of our uh, colleagues here on campus has made of the Finger Lakes region. And what's interesting, about this, I think if you look, as you can see, and this is Seneca Lake here, hopefully you can see my pointer, is you know the northern part here where Geneva is, it's a fairly you know, flat area. But as you go further south um, for all the lakes, you definitely get into higher elevation terrain. And that has tremendous implications for when it rains, how fast the rain goes into the lakes. And you know, with climate change, one of the things that we're seeing more and more are these large precipitation systems where fronts really just get stuck for various meteorological re reasons, but they can have, you know, you know, we're seeing this across the globe, um, but in 2018, there was this amazing precipitation event that happened in August. And here's pictures from the Democrat and Chronicle, the newspaper in Rochester of a, of a rainstorm. And, this radar right here that was taken at 3.30 a.m., there was nine inches of rain recorded in this location. And if you look at that location and put it on this map, it's right here on one of the higher points between Seneca Lake here and Cayuga Lake. And those nine inches of rain, you know, brought so much water speeding down the hill. And this is near Lodi Point, if you know where that is, and just washed the debris, I mean, you can see hot water heaters. There was somebody who was at the bottom of this who opened the door to where they were staying and they were swept into the lake. I mean, luckily there was no loss of life that day, but these types of precipitation events are unfortunately becoming more, you know, more frequent and, you know, we're likely going to see more of those moving forward. Just to put this into the, you know, construct, if you will, in context with the Great Lakes, um, in addition to these heavy precipitation events that are increasing, we're also seeing this 2.3 degree you know, Fahrenheit average temperature rise um, in, over the last 50 years. And so with that, you know, there's tremendous impacts that can happen from the water, in the water. So I'm going to now transition to John, who's going to then walk us through some of the work that he and our students have been doing. And so John, please take it away. Cool. Well, what I first thought I would do is share some uh, of water temperature data that uh, I've been collecting, um, at least in Seneca Lake since 1995, when I first got here. Um, and as you can see in the plot on the left, um, maybe I can move my mouse. Yeah, you can. Um, um, in this plot over here, you can see it's progressively getting warmer and warmer, especially in, in the summer months. For each individual year, it gets, uh, starts really cold in the spring, but then gets warm in the summer, then cools off again. And that happens every year. But the important thing here is the lakes have warmed up. And if you do a really simple um, um, straight line trend to it, it's warmed up about two tenths of a degree centigrade or around half a degree Fahrenheit every year um, um, since I've been here the, what, 25 years ago or something along those lines. I can find similar trends in the other Finger Lakes. I just picked out one of them, Alaska Lake, shown over on the right hand side, where it's also warmed up a similar. 0.2 degrees centigrade per year. So clearly climate change is having an impact on the lakes. And, and because of that, it might have a bunch of other impacts on, on other things that we'll see um, hopefully in, in the next slide. 
Next slide. There we go. One of the things is um, um, warmer water is believed to have um, 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 grave impact on the development and, and colonization of blue-green algae. Um, actually, I shouldn't use blue-green blue algae because it's the wrong name. It should be called cyanobacteria. I'm always reminded this by my biology friends and those who've had me in a class before realize that I hate biology, so I usually don't use the right names for anything. But anyway, blue-green algae, um, um, it's not really algae, it's actually bacteria. Um, it's got a much more simple cell structure. Um, um, it's one of the first fossils recognized on Earth some three and a half billion years ago. Um, because it's been around for a long time, it's diversified to many millions of environments. Um, it was the initial source of oxygen to the atmosphere. It can perform photo photosynthesis using a blue-green pigment. Um, um, because of that, it can adapt to many different things. They're also a health concern in that some species of cyanobacteria can secrete toxins. The toxins are varied, every, anywhere from developing a skin rash to attacking your nervous system where you'll eventually die. Um, um, some of these toxins have been um, detected in public or municipal water system. Um, probably the biggest scare was to the city of Toledo back in 2014. Um, um, the picture on the lower right hand side is um, their water intake and, and someone took a scoop of water in that glass. That's what they were pumping throughout the entire city. And if you look at the satellite photo on the right hand side, that green water um, that's the, the extent of the bloom that they were pumping out of to then put into the city. It caused a do not drink order for the city of Toledo. It impacted a half a million people, um, so on and so forth. Closer to home, they've actually found blue-green algae in the um, um, drinking water in, in Skiniatolis and in, in, in Rushville and in the city of Auburn and other places as well. Um, so clearly it's going to impact our regional tourism. It's going to then impact our economy and and, and a bunch of other things. So next slide. Um, if you look at the Finger Lakes, um, um, this is a, a chart that's been compiled by the DEC showing the um, onset of uh, cyanobacteria in different lakes going from Kinesis at the top way down to a Tisco down at the bottom. Um, um, different lakes have, have or, or they found cyanobacteria in um, at different years in, in all these different lakes, but as we get to the last couple of years, they've actually found it in all the lakes. Um, um, they aren't quite reporting whether it's suspicious, confirmed, or high toxins anymore because it's too expensive to measure the toxin concentrations. Um, but if you look at the numbers in the, the 2020 column, that's the number of blooms that were actually detected by various um, volunteer groups. Some interesting features about these blue-green algae blooms, almost always they're found at the shoreline. And if you look at the two maps on the right-hand side, um, um, you can see where these blooms were. The size of the bubble was actually the size of the bloom. Um, rarely do you see any out in the middle of the lake. This is unfortunate because if they occur right at the shoreline, that's where people want to use the lake, go swimming, put their dog in the water, and do a bunch of other things, go boating. And, and so it's going to start impacting um, um, home values at the, at, along the shoreline as well. Um, this is true for most of the Finger Lakes. Um, the picture down in the lower right actually so, shows some um, blue-green algae blooms pointed out by the red arrows. It's literally hugging the shoreline, um, maybe not going out more than 10 or 20 feet um, 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 in, in some instances. Occasionally, it can cover the entire lake, but not all the time. So next slide. Next slide um, asks the question, has cyanobacteria always been in the Finger Lakes plankton? Well, I got data that goes back to around 2005, where I've actually taken plankton toes out of the eight easternmost Finger Lakes, and there's always um, um, cyanobacteria in the plankton, but never enough until the recent few years to form a bloom that will then come, cause problems, either health concerns or others, um, or be unsightly or so on and so forth. Um, um, the other major algal groups are also shown there, um, whether it's diatoms or dinoflagellates or, or um, green algae, um, they're always there as well. Matter of fact, if you go back to some of the earliest luminological reports about the Finger Lakes by um, Burge and Jude, um, um, they reported seeing um, cyanobacteria in the, their plankton toes as well. So something in the last couple of years must have triggered the recent blooms. 
So you start thinking about um, some of the environmental preferences for these blooms. One, they like warmer water because they have mechanisms they have gas vacuoles that allow them to float and be more buoyant in warmer water. Um, they like sunny skies so they can do photosynthesis. They like calm conditions because if it's too windy, they get mixed down into the water column some. And in the past, they've always been um, um, responsive or found in lakes with lots of nutrients, excess of nutrients. Now, what's sort of interesting in the Finger Lakes in, um, um, case is that most of the Finger Lakes are relatively nutrient poor. So it's strange that we're actually getting blooms of, of, of cyanobacteria because we don't really have the nutrients for that. So what I'll do is go through some of these examples and see if we've had warmer water or sunnier skies or so on and so forth to see if some of these factors might have um, influenced what's going on. Next slide. Well, I'll get back to these temperature records. In Seneca Lake, the last one, two, three, four, five years is when we've had um, um, cyanobacteria events, and it looks like those were some of the warmest years on record. Matter of fact, last year, 2020, was the warmest summer um, um, summer temperatures on record. Same things going on for Owasco Lake, um, um, maybe not quite to the same extent, um, but most of those years where they found good cyanobacteria blooms, that was primarily warmer water. So, okay, warmer water, that's fine, um, seems to match. But if you look at the next slide, um, here are, I've measured um, water temperatures that not only offshore by a, a water quality monitoring buoy, but also at a number of nearshore sites. Um, um, the water temperature across the lake seems to track itself very well from um, the middle of June through the middle of October, thereabouts. Um, down at the bottom in the squares, it's when they actually had um, cyanobacteria events happen along the shoreline. And what I'd like to point out is um, these events down here usually happen when the water's cold, not when it's hot. So these events down here happened when the water was cold, not when it was hot. Um, and, and that's somewhat surprising, um, but you can actually put this into a, a bigger picture in that when we get to the nutrient story, we'll find out that there's not enough nutrients in the open water to support these blooms. And maybe this warmer water has um, um, something to do it to then release more nutrients to then um, actually get the blooms going. So hopefully I'll remember to get back to that story um, when we get to it. Next slide, please. Sunny skies. Here's a picture taken by drone. It's the northern end of Alaska Lake. Looks pretty darn sunny to me. But the problem with this is whenever you get sunny skies, you don't always have a bloom. And you might say, well, it's got to be calm as well. Well, whenever you have sunny skies and calm weather, you don't always get a bloom. And I've been putting monitoring sites around all these dock locations. Um, there's a weather station there shown on the right-hand side. It actually has a camera, which takes a picture of the water surface to record when there's blooms. And it turns out around 30% of the time when it's sunny and calm, you have a bloom. But not the other 70%. So something else has to be going on. And, and that something else is probably um, the nutrients that these um, um, cyanobacteria need to be able to grow. Next slide. So if you look at um, the concentrations of some of these um, cyanobacteria blooms, um, it's shown in the graph on the right. Um, um, these concentrations are relatively high in each individual bloom. And then you can use these concentrations and using red field ratios, figure out what the um, phosphorus concentration is in these blooms. And then you can compare it to, here I have a plot of the last um, 15 years or so of total phosphorus concentrations in the open water of Seneca Lake. Note, rarely does it get above 20 micrograms per liter. 20 micrograms per liter is here, way insufficient to support these blooms, especially in the most recent years. So we gotta come up with another source of nutrients. One of the things I've been doing in the last three or four years is actually sampling in the nearshore zone in about two or three meters of water. Occasionally my propeller hits a rock and I got to get a new propeller and a bunch of other problems along those lines, but eh, not all the time. I've gotten to know where some of these rocks are in the, in the nearshore sites that I go to, so I can now develop uh, missing them. Those nearshore sites really didn't have much different concentrations than you see out in the open water. So something needs to be going on with these nutrients, which then helps support these um, cyanobacteria blooms. Next slide. That something else 
comes from a couple of experiments that I've been doing. One is I took a bunch of mud and I put it into each one of these flasks. I put these flasks with distilled water in the windowsill of my office and let it sit there. Lo and behold, within a week, I had cyanobacteria blooms. So there must be something about the mud that one houses the blooms, or at least the resting stage of the cyanobacteria, two has enough nutrients within it to then allow the precipitation of those blooms. That to me is pretty novel. So maybe something's going on um, um, with the lakes that actually um, you need the nutrients that are hidden within the mud. They have to get released by some weather event, perhaps that cooling of the temperatures um, when you get the blooms is related to a wind mixing event of the surface sediments, um, 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 so on and so forth. I also have been noting that where the blooms are most intense usually correspond to where there's the largest abundance of macrophytes, dead macrophytes, dead weeds along the, um, um, along the shoreline. Um, um, so you need to wait a little bit from midsummer when these macrophytes are growing to when they actually get ripped up by a wind event or something else, then die. And then as they decay, regular bacteria um, um, decay in this um, um, organic mass, it will release the nutrients that will then perhaps stimulate um, um, these um, cyanobacteria blooms in the near shore region. Um, so this nutrient question is gonna be the focus of, of the summer's work. There's a number of students that are gonna be measuring um, the weed abundance and also the zebra and frog muscle abundance because they might have a play and actually look at nutrients hidden in the sediments as well um, um, to figure out if yes, indeed, this is where the excess nutrients come from to then um, um, formulate these blooms. Next slide, I think goes back to Lisa. Yep, it does. Thanks everybody. I'll be here if you want to chat later on. Lisa, thanks. you're on mute. Yep, thanks, John. Um, I just wanted to end up with a few um, slides about some of the programs we have with our local watershed associations because um, you know, we partner all the time with local organizations and we work very closely um, with our neighboring lakes to actually screen a lot of the samples along the shoreline. You know, people are very concerned about this because you don't want your pets uh, recreating in the water, your children's grandchildren swimming, um, you know, because you can have not only uh, neurotoxin reactions, but their the liver damage, they really can damage a lot of organ system. So understandably, people that are recreating on the on the lakefront want to understand more about the samples that they're seeing. If they're seeing slimy green water, does it actually mean that there's cyanobacteria in it? And then are those cyan cyanobacteria producing toxins? And so um, this is just a setup of a sample that a citizen scientist collected, brought to the FLI. We have instrumentation where we can actually look at the chlorophyll and assign it to different phytoplankton groups and cyanobacteria in particular. This is what some of these organisms look like under the microscope. This is microcystis, this is a phanazomenon. And then we also have instrumentation um, that from a grant recently from New York State that allows us to measure the toxin levels in those samples. So, you know, this is very much a student and professional research. Um, it's actually a global problem. But you know we have a lot of different um, groups of people on campus involved in trying to better understand what's happening with these samples and with our lakes. And I just want to highlight like one last slide on research. Um, in addition to the factors that John talked about, these cyanobacteria are part of really a community um, of other organisms that are part of a bloom. So if you are familiar with the term microbiome, and you think of all the bacteria that are in you know, your, your gut, the, the blooms also have many different types of, of bacteria and other organisms that are associated with them. And so we've been working for the last couple of years with a Cornell and a professor, Ruth Richardson, she's in the environmental engineering program there. And so we've been trying to couple what we do, which is mainly the chlorophyll and the toxin measurements along with a genomic approach. So looking at the DNA and the community composition of these blooms. And this is just some data, if you're familiar with how, what DNA looks like when it comes out from analysis, you know, you can essentially 
look at the proportion of the different phyla of bacteria that are part of these bloom samples. And so this is a has been a great partnership. So we've had undergraduates working with um, from HWS working with undergraduates from Cornell, but also some PhD students. And so we've we're very actively engaged in this um, this program area with Cornell. And um, we have just received notice that we have a second year funding through the New York State Water Resources Institute. So um, with that, really, our students really get a chance to do very much hands on work. This is, you know, a picture from I think this is from 2018 Our the interns that are the summer research students that are here, many of them just graduated a couple of weeks ago. So it's always bittersweet to see the students, but we also know that they're moving on to great places. And we also last summer did a remote um, summer research kind of um, experience where FLI staff got to do a lot of the hands-on science, but we were also sending information and data back to the students. So we, you know, actively stayed um, engaged with them. And the other thing, you know, with the FLI is we hire every summer about 40 full-time students, and we're right in the middle of onboarding everyone. So we have 40 people, 40 different people working across all the different lakes um, that are fully paid. And I, you know, when you think about economic development and how it ties into the Finger Lakes, taking care of these lakes and being good stewards is something we should be investing in. And these are great job opportunities for college students and to get, you know, experience working with the public, but also working with the science and just having a better understanding of the region. Because as a as an upstate New York native, uh, I will say so summers are obviously the best, my favorite season here. And it's great that the students have a chance to also uh, be here for that that experience. I just, it, we always want to acknowledge our funding sources. As Jerry said, we, you know, we work with, you know, all levels of government as well as with private foundations. And so we've been successful in bringing dollars to, to work on behalf of the Finger Lakes um, region. And one new funder that I just want to point out here is we recently partnered with the Wild Center, uh, which is in the Adirondacks, and we have a climate change resilience grant funded by NOAA. And so this is to work with rural youth to um, host youth climate summits in the Finger Lakes and in the Adirondacks. And, in, you know, basically make sure that the conversation about climate change is moving forward. I mean, often the students, you know, are super engaged even at the high school level and they're trying to persuade their administrators. And so we provide um, opportunities for students and teachers to come together to try to figure out how to, to move the dial on this issue um, in, you know, across New York State. So also Figure Lakes Institute staff, we have 10 full-time staff members. The vast majority of these people are funded by soft money. So these grants and they help to do the project so that we can go and get more money. And then we also work with faculty members in biology, environmental studies, physics, geoscience, economics, um, really across the board on campus. And this is just a small snapshot of the number of faculty that we work with. And then John, I don't know if you want to say anything about your students, but I know you've worked with a number of these over the years. So here's a listing of the students that have worked on more or less major projects or hired during the summer over since, um, since I got here in 94. There was about a hundred of them. I'm pretty impressed. Some of them have gone on to done very good things. That's enough. Next. Thanks, John. And with that, thank you all for attending. And um, we hope that you've learned a little bit more about climate change and we are anxious to hear from you. And um, we appreciate your time and your interest in listening to our program today. Great. Lisa and John, thanks so much. Um, uh, that was terrific. Um, do we have, um, if anybody has a question, um, you can use the chat um, or uh, just uh, raise your hand and um, we're happy to uh, uh, address the questions. Well, we have While we're getting while we're getting started, um, Catherine. Oh yeah, I uh, that was a great presentation. It was great to uh, see all the work that's been done. I used to be uh, one of Half Moon's students back in the day. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, your name uh, was on that list. Yeah, it was. I saw yeah. it. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, now now I work at the, um, the the Nature Conservancy on Long Island on their water quality improvement program, and um, we uh, we found that um, agricultural runoff is no longer like the number one source of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution on the island, and that it's actually been switching over to septic systems as the number one cause of nitrogen pollution. Um, do you think that is also happening on the Finger Lakes? John and Lisa. Uh, I'll take a quick stab at it. Um, our population, I mean, I understand the population density for Long Island and the importance of nitrogen. Um, that's certainly one reason that I can see septic systems being um, more of an issue there. I, we've had that question and uh, posed to us many times, you know, basically, is it the cows, is it the septic systems, is it the people? And I think if we look at the number of people that usually cows went out in several of these areas and there's really no treatment whatsoever in their runoff from their system. Um, but I would also just say we all play a role in, you know, mitigating nutrients in our you know, anything, any water running into the lakes is important. And so our own practices of, you know, maintaining our septic systems, if we don't have, you know, public sewer, and then also things that we can do on the land with just holding water there, but also, you know, lawn care and things like that, you know, we can play a role in our own local area. But I would say for the Finger Lakes, the most of the runoff is coming from agricultural activities. And I'm glad this is being recorded. So I, this can be seen later. So, so I'll, I'll add to that. I've been actually monitoring the number of streams that go into Wasco Lake pretty closely. Um, and, and that data shows that probably around 90% of all the nutrients get into the lake come from non-point sources. So it's, it's not municipal wastewater treatment plants, it's not septic systems, it's not any pipe that's going into the lake. It's coming runoff from the landscape. And so the majority of that is coming from um, agricultural sector, either the, the CAFO operations, the concentrated animal feedlot operations of which there are a number in the Alaska watershed or it's just run off from farmers fields um, because they don't have very good practices to disposal of any of that waste or buffer strips to keep it onto the field. That's changing though and, and partly changing because over the, I don't know, since 2005, I've been giving them the hard data again and again and again every year in public meetings. And they're finally agreeing to the fact that yes, indeed, okay, we got to do something about it. and and now they're passing legislation for Cuga County to actually get something done. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, thanks uh, for the response. And uh, I remember sampling those streams in Owasco. And oh yeah, to a bunch I'm, of I'm gonna do it again Monday if you wanna come up. <laughs> I know, I'm good, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's only gonna be about 90 degrees, that's all, you know, it's not too bad. I'm praying for your uh, research students this summer then. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Catherine. Um, let me follow up just on a question of, since we've talked about the wine industry, is the wine industry kind of in the middle here in terms, of, does the wine industry, um, we've talked about how important the lakes are to the wine industry, but also is, especially as the industry grows uh, almost um, uh, by the day, um, is there, uh, what, what impact does, does the growing uh, viticulture industry have, uh, if any, um, on the negative side, if, there's, if, if that may be the case? So I've actually been told by a number of soil and water people um, that should know the answer to this. And, and they basically said that if you're growing good grapes, you try your best to starve them of nutrients. And you want to starve them of nutrients so that they don't make big leaves. Instead, they make really good grapes. So it, from that, it suggests that um, most of the nutrient running runoff isn't coming from the, the winery sector, but instead it's coming from the cornfields or the um, soybeans or, or the, the cows and the spreading of the manure and, and other things that cows um, excrete um, 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 on various fields around in the area. I, I can just add, you know, a short little piece to that. The, I you know, I think one of the cool things, and Jerry, you know more about this than I with your um, connections, but, you know, the wine industry around here is very conscious of their 
brand and a lot, you know, and really support each other. And I would say, you know, like what we've been fortunate enough to be able to understand more about is partnerships with like the, the wine and beverage industry uh, uh, association really across New York state. And they're pursuing doll, you know, dollars to basically put in like some sustainability measures and also try to kind of have a scorecard to rate when people are doing the right things so that, you know, this region and certain wineries who are doing good practices for water quality management are going to be recognized for it. And so there's a whole industry group that's pursuing that. And, um, you know, that's we our Seneca Watershed Steward, who's based at the Finger Lakes Institute, Ian Smith, is playing an active role in helping be the third party that could actually validate that those practices are um, resulting in cleaner water and less nutrients going in. Great, thank you. Other questions from, uh, from our uh, participants? There's one in the chat, I think. So I'll read the question from the chat. Um, Leslie asks um, or states that she volunteers for the Connecticut River Conservancy. And she was wondering, are there um, many volunteers helping with the um, studying cleanup of the Finger Lakes as well? And, and the, the simple answer to that is yes. There's literally hundreds of them. Um, probably the biggest example would be um, most of the lakes will have volunteers checking their shoreline every week for the presence of cyanobacteria blooms. And if they see them, they take the picture, they send the picture to a central website so it gets posted, the DEC gets notified. Um, so each volunteer will have a, about a mile of shoreline to then, to then look at and investigate every week so that we get a very good record of the number of blooms that are returning on the various finger lakes. Now, maybe Lisa has some more to add to all that, but um, that's one when some of the, the bloom data that I was showing you came from these volunteer groups. The only thing I would add is, um, you know, there's a lot of really talented people that are members of the watershed groups. A lot of times they're retired engineers and doctors and attorneys and they, um, they take, I don't, John, I don't want to speak for you, but I know that they will, um, they, get into the science on a really big level and they really like to understand what's going on. And so we do a lot of technical conversations with them. I mean, I have, I've been working very closely with the Canandaigua Lake Association pretty recently and we meet monthly and we have a DEC representative there. We have a, a watershed a manager as well as the association and they, they ask really good questions. So, I mean, people are very, very engaged around here. So I see there's a, another question in the, the chat from Maureen and, and she's asking how does or will the Bitcoin mining operation affect the health of the lake? For those of you not aware of Bitcoin, um, basically what you're using is using computers to mine Bitcoin, generate the code to unlock the, um, 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 the, 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 the monetary value of Bitcoin um, so the more computers you have, the faster you are to actually mine Bitcoin and Bitcoin has monetary value associated with it. So you can become very rich the more Bitcoin you accumulate. Um, it turns out that some of the very old um, power plants that we have in the area, which used to be coal fire are now getting converted to natural gas fired power plants are quite economic to run and sell electricity to the grid but they are economic to run to mine Bitcoin, especially the one down, um, down in Dresden on the shores of Seneca Lake. Um, what it's doing is within its cavernous um, um, operations, it's putting in rows and rows and rows of computers and basically all the power it produces, it's taking and harnessing to just run their computers to then mine Bitcoin. Now, for those of you who know anything about energy generation, um, um, you have to cool that steam that you make by heating up um, um, the water to make the steam in the first place to then generate the electricity. Use cooling water from the lake to then cool down that steam. Um, and that's drawn directly from Seneca Lake and the waste heat is then put right back into the Cuca outlet, getting into the Cuca Lake. So there are concerns, warmer water, as we already said in this presentation, might precipitate more cyanobacteria the question of how much warmer the lake is actually getting is 
hasn't quite been answered yet. If there might be, or there's definitely a local impact um, um, for the entire lake, it's probably not gonna be a major impact. Most of that warming that I've seen um, um, in the surface water of the Finger Lakes isn't because of, of, of the power plant operations. You can actually do a calculation to confirm that. However, um, I would go on to say that the impact that some of these plants can then have is more on a, a, a regional scale in that if you're generating all this electricity to run your computers, the generation of that electricity from fossil fuels will then put greenhouse gases and other things into the atmosphere. Um, um, Tom Drennan and I did back of the envelope calculations with a student this past year, which suggests that if they use all the power from the Greenwich plant down in Dresden, to then generate the electricity to run the computers to mine Bitcoin, you will then liberate as much greenhouse gases as about 100,000 cars in a given year. That to me is unbelievably significant in that someone, somewhere, some investor is then forcing this plant to then ruin our local environment, not only ruin our environment, but then making the globe even warmer just for his profit, nothing else than him making money, which to me, I mean, I don't mind generating electricity and making a few greenhouse gases that people get electricity to heat their homes or turn on lights or air conditioners or whatever they have to do, but just to make money, this is my personal bias, you've probably heard, um, it's really, really ludicrous. There, I'll stop the editorial right there. Well, uh, thanks, John. I mean, it's been um, for those of uh, paying attention closely here. It's it's a, it's a very uh, significant issue, and it's getting a great deal of attention. Um, so, it's uh, uh, Maureen. Thanks for a very timely question. Um, I actually I actually have a bunch of temperature loggers out in Seneca Lake, just outside of the Cuca Outlet, and a bunch going up the outlet that are measuring temperatures as we speak. And by December, I should recover those and then I'll be able to give you a more quantitative answer to how they're impacting the work. I'm sure you know, know that uh, even NPR did a special specifically on this going on in the Finger Lakes. Yep. So it's, it is getting publicity. Yep, they're, they're, they're thinking of actually using the Millican plant, which goes in um, it's on the shores of Cuyuga Lake as well. Right. Because right. um, that one shut down to coal, but they're going to turn it into natural gas. And, and, and there's investors that do Bitcoin that are driving that as well. Yeah. The other thing I heard recently is New York State just passed a moratorium to ban it. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I just heard that snippet on NPR as I was driving home one day. Maybe it's not true. It's proposed. It's just proposed, okay. I think so at this point. Yeah. Well, I hope it works. <laughs> well, um, are there any other questions? No, no more in the chat. Um, yes. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Yep. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, awesome. So I used to work with John and the FLA Trail undergrad. And then in my final semester at undergrad, I worked with John independently to assess surface water temperatures in the Finger Lakes. So to prep for this meeting, I took a look at my last paper and I saw that in our discussion, we started to tease at a couple different possibilities. So I would like to see, it's been two years since I graduated where you sit on these possibilities right now. And the two that I kind of wanted to point at were um, with increased surface water temperatures, that could mean like more stratification or later mixing events. And then you spoke about the mud project that you started doing in your office. How do you think that would impact, if there's no mixing, how do you release the nutrients from the mud to get the cyanobacteria? Okay, because so it would I'll, need I'll the take nutrients. an initial stab and I'm sure Lisa can be more biological about all this. <laughs> um, in, in my very simplistic, um, simple-minded biological approach, warmer water will then drive faster bacterial decay of the organic matter. Yes. Yeah. And if you get faster bacterial decay, you can then release more nutrients into the mud. And then if you can stir that mud a little bit, then you'll get more nutrients released so that um, cyanobacteria can then have a bigger bloom. Um, and then the mud that you're mixing, is this 
closer to the shore or is it? Um, so, so the mud that you're mixing is due to waves um, driven by wind. Okay. So the waves have a circular motion in the water column. Yeah. If you remember luminology yeah. from long, long ago. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and as, as you, that, that circular motion can then stir up the sediments. So, so okay. whatever the wind's blowing on shore, um, the shoreline's always muddy. That's the reason why. Okay. In that mud is good nutrients. Yeah. Okay. And then I also saw in our discussion that um, with less mixing, this would give them more opportunity and time to grow without disruption, right? So then yes. we also mentioned how blue or cyanobacteria can migrate through the water column and outcompete other algae or other, you know, biological things. So that would lead to more HABs. Is that where we're standing right now? Yep. Okay. And 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 I'm a I'm I'm a proponent of saying once you had a bloom event when they die they sink down into the mud and they will decay, mm -hmm. which sort of self perpetuates this this the cycle of more nutrients to then get the next bloom in the same mm -hmm. location. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, sorry. On the other side, veering away from tab. With warmer water, you're going to have less dissolved oxygen. Yep. So then that would affect the other biology, like the ecosystem in general, because then there are things like snails and mussels and fish that can't really, you know, do their thing as well. So. Lisa, do you have a take on that? Thanks. Sure. I was just going to say, I think that, you know, one thing that we didn't really talk about was the food webs here. And, you know, as a biologist, that's something I've been studying for the last several decades. And um, so I think we always have to think about the biological organisms and especially the near shore area because of the way the quagga mussels have really taken the nutrients that really used to be kind of out in the middle of the lake and they brought everything to the near shore region. And quagga mussels, we know they take, they, they take in a lot of water. They can filter a lot of water each day and they keep the good algae as a food source and they spit out um, the stuff that they don't really find nutritious. And most of those are cyanobacteria. So the invasive species question is very much interwoven with this climate change issue. And we really need to look at it as a system. Um, and so, you know, the, I, there's, you know, you talked about warm water and that could then impact the cold water fisheries that drive a lot of the economic activity in the Finger Lakes because people want to come here and fish for lake trout and you know, other cold water species. But on the same token, I'll just you know, be that scientist that says on one hand there's this, but then on the other hand, the warm water fisheries in certain lakes like Cayuga Lake and Owasco Lake have attracted like the Bassmasters because there are so many fish available and the production in those lakes do support a very robust fish community. So, you know, there's you know, there's changes certainly, and I think you know, we need to recognize that there's good and bad. But, you know, certainly climate change as a whole, it's going to be not great for our lakes. And it's certainly going to be a big change in how we do business. I agree. Well, um, John and Lisa, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to add, uh, just going back to the video, um, you saw some uh, really terrific images of the William Scanling research vessel. Um, and um, the vessel, uh, led by Captain Dave Brown, left on Wednesday, uh, this past uh, Wednesday, a week ago, um, to, uh, and went through um, the canals uh, and out into Lake Erie and is now in Cleveland and it is in dry dock. And for the next five to seven weeks, the Scanling is being, uh, getting a tune up, if you will. Um, and um, we expect it will be back uh, in plenty of time for the fall semester but we've, uh, we've raised uh, most of the money uh, to uh, fund the structural repairs to the Scanlane as well as some enhanced technology. So um, we will um, keep everyone posted uh, as the uh, Dave and the crew uh, make their way back uh, later in the summer, uh, back to Seneca Lake uh, and the Scanlane will be, will be ready for um, a few more generations of uh, Hobart and William Smith students, as well as uh, the students in the area high schools that Lisa referred to with Science on Seneca, which is a, a program that we're extremely proud of as well. So um, 
I'll leave you with that. If there's, um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, again, uh, John and Lisa, thanks so much for sharing uh, not just your knowledge, but also your, your clear enthusiasm and your passion uh, for the subject matter. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's a hallmark of Hobart and William Smith. Um, it's not just uh, it's not just knowing uh, and sharing your knowledge, but sharing it with the kind of passion uh, and commitment that you have. So, uh, thank you, uh, and thank all of you uh, for joining us. And uh, we uh, wish you a great weekend. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, the rest of the graduation and reunion weekend uh, here in Geneva.